the conception of the project has occurred in the apartments of the one John Carmack. The servant is not the first nor the last depiction of the man's technological prowess. How it is, arguably, his most notable one. For in that moment, Carmack built what is to become known as the Doom Engine. That's right, guys. Today we're covering none other than the granddaddy of all first-person shooters, the 1993 classic Doom. In addition to being one of the most important games ever created, Doom is known for being surprisingly playable for an old game. Astonishingly playable, to be honest. Like, you can pick it up right now and it will be fun to play. Ah, and don't even get me started on Doom 2, because this game is so goddamn good, I pray to it every once in a while. How I just see no point in reviewing it without covering Doom 1 first, so I hope this clears out any confusions that you might have had. To be honest, I'm much more interested in why I want you to review Wolfenstein 3D. Wouldn't it make much more sense to review it first and then, after you've covered all the basics, tackle the much more sophisticated design of Doom? Yeah, I guess so. So why aren't you doing it then? Because I hate Wolfenstein 3D, okay? I hate this game so much, I just don't want to play it again. I've spent 12 hours beating every single level of this boring, dated, primitive piece of crap game and I'm not willing to put myself through that ever again. Oh wow, you really do hate this game, don't you? You know what, if we are being totally honest here, I actually think that Catacomb 3D was a better game than Wolfenstein. Okay, George. I get that you don't like Wolf 3D, but now you're pushing it way too far. I need you to think about what you are saying. Yeah, maybe I got a bit too carried away with that. But anyway, let's play Doom already. I haven't played this game in quite some time and I remember it being quite difficult, so let's start with the easiest difficulty. Oh my god, this level. To say that it is iconic would be an understatement. Even if you have only fleeting familiarity with Doom, chances are you will still recognize this level. And as for me, it was burned into my mind. Even though it is largely subjective, there is a tangible reason for why this level feels so iconic. You see, this was the last level that Romero worked on in Doom. John Romero is an exceptional game designer who was responsible for not just the level design of the entire first episode of Doom, but for the creation of the tools with which to make those levels. Largely because of those tools, all levels in this game were so polished. It was very easy to have an idea, immediately realize it in the Doom engine and then proceed to refine the level while playing it on one monitor and editing it on the other. And I think it becomes extremely evident in this particular level since, you know, it's perfect. Every single room and set piece have a distinct purpose. You see this imp in the distance, for example. There is a reason he is positioned so high, since you can't look up or down this game, you can't aim at him. But you are inclined to shoot in his direction anyway. And BAM! Now you've been taught that you can shoot enemies even if they are elevated above your line of sight. Not only that, but his placement ensures that he will be far away when you encounter him, and therefore you will notice the slow flight of his fireballs and learn to dodge them. What is also cool is that when you reach the exit room, you feel like you've missed out on that blue armor you saw earlier, and decide to go back, and in doing so you will notice that the elevated place descended, opening a new passage in which you get a new weapon. This encourages the player to explore the future levels. This, isn't it just 
awesome level design. I mean, just look at this blue liquid, at those green explosive barrels, at this view of mountains in the background. Isn't there something appealing about those graphics and that style? And hey, do you see this little room here? Even that has a purpose. Romero intended it to juxtapose the squareness of the previous room with the weird angles and transition you into the zigzag of the acid room. George, what's gotten to you all of a sudden? You're talking about this game like it's Chrono Cross or something. Just look. Those graphics are horrible. They're both technologically and aesthetically dated. So why are you acting like that? Okay, I, I guess I should just say it now before we get too far into this game. Doom was one of the very first games I've ever played. Really? Yeah. It was my second game. Mm-hmm. Well, now at least I know why you had such a weird opinion of Wolf 3D. You are just nostalgia blinded. Oh, come on, Seal. Isn't it obvious that Doom is a better game? Of course it's obvious, but it doesn't change the fact that you were gushing over every little detail in the most unprofessional manner. Okay, I'll... Try to restrain myself from now on, alright? So where was I? Oh yeah, I was about to kill someone. Now, why was that satisfying? Contrary to what some people might believe, the satisfaction from shooting in a video game comes not so much from the very act of killing or inflicting pain onto another. That's the kind of sick joy a maniac would have, no, what is actually satisfying is the successful overcoming of an obstacle. Shooting enemies is a skill-based gameplay, so when you kill an enemy, what your mind registers is that it solved the problem. This is why it feels so rewarding and in order to enhance that feeling, there needs to be some form of feedback. Enemy will visibly contort, audibly scream, physically move, basically he will react and in this reaction you will get a clear visual reaffirmation of a task well performed and that will make you feel a distinct sense of satisfaction. Let me put it this way, if you were to isolate an act of killing an individual in a piece of software, it would be both morally horrible and boring, since aside from the concept, there would be nothing. On the other hand, if you were to make a functioning FPS gameplay with skill, enemies reacting and so on, just without violence, it will be engaging. And now that I've proven that I'm not a psychopath for liking those kind of games, Let's delve into why exactly it feels so nice to kill people. The satisfaction of a shooting mechanic comes from how well the game translates the feel of a shot to the player, aka gunplay, and from how the enemy reacts to the shot, aka feedback. If the game manages to design those two elements well, then shooting in this game will be fun, and Doom is exemplary in this regard. The enemies react to your shots with animations, and <laughs> let me tell you, those animations are tasty. Enemies don't just acknowledge your bullets, they convey pain in an exaggerated fashion, which becomes an immediate and clear implication of how great of an impact your shot left on the enemy. What also helps in this regard is hearing enemies' screams and in Doom enemies audibly react to every single impact. In fact, their moans of pain can come in such a rapid succession that they can stack. Needless to say that with such an array of elements, the impact of each shot becomes palpable. And now for the big one, the death animations. Oh, the death animations. I think this might be a good time to tell you a bit about the man behind those animations, Adrian Carmack, because I've heard some interesting rumors about this guy. Adrian was an introverted artist with a rough childhood. After he graduated from art school and needed money, he found a job at a hospital. 
the job of photocopying the grotesque wounds of the patients in the medical care. This work left a profound mark on Adrian, who already had a fascination with the dark and disturbing subject matter. Basically, instead of being repelled by those wounds, he wanted to incorporate them into his art. This inclination of his was repressed for a long time, so when the two Johns decided to make a violent game with the theme of demons versus technology, they pretty much set him loose. What resulted was this. A game that combines elements of sci-fi, being reminiscent of Aliens and H. A. Geiger's work, who was of course Adrian's idol, and the demonic occult imagery into one bloody, disturbing mess. And I've got to say that the resulting atmosphere is remarkable. George, are you going to play the entire game like this? Like what? You know what I mean. The difficulty is clearly too easy for you. Well, I, I mean, I guess so. Okay, so, look, Doom was a game of my childhood, okay? I just don't want the video to make it look like I suck at this game. What kind of stupid reason is that, Josh? Are you being serious right now? Okay, 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 you're right, I'm sorry. I'll switch to a higher difficulty. Are you happy now? No, because you are a biased reviewer. Okay, you know what truly makes gameplay of Doom fun? Let me demonstrate. Here is a standard map from Halo. This is a standard map from Call of Duty. And this is a typical map of Doom. You see the difference? The levels are big and complex. They are not just strings of events through which the developers drag the player while providing him with as little freedom as possible. No, there are always different ways to go and many secrets to uncover, which makes those levels feel almost non-linear. I mean, look at the one with this big open space, or at the level with the crate maze in the middle. By the way, this warehouse was originally started by Tom Hall, who eventually left it due to creative conflicts that arose between him and the team. He wanted Doom to be a story-driven experience with involving and thoughtful gameplay, and in his design document, which he entitled The Doom Bible, you can see that he basically wanted to make a system shock. The problem was that in doing so, he kind of sacrificed fun to realism. Which is why when Romero designed his level editor and was starting to work on his abstract levels that prioritized fun, the team, especially Karma, chose to side with Romero and went in the direction of pure, unapologetic fun. The result is definitely worth it. Fundamentally, every level in Doom is a maze. And it might sound boring, but it is incredibly fun to play those levels, especially considering how fast-paced the gameplay is. Which of course revolves around navigating the level in search of an exit while defeating enemies that stand in your way. During those encounters, you will inevitably take damage or waste ammo, so since in Doom, unlike many modern shooters, health doesn't self-replenish you will have to find items to stay alive. This is what I like to call the conventional health system, and it fits the maze-like level design of Doom like a glove. How its alternative, the self-replenishing health system, is not inherently bad, it's just that the difference in how those two affect the gameplay is monumental. To properly understand this, I want you to imagine how Doom would play out without items, if health was just self-replenishing. In addition to complete disappearance of secrets, imagine how empty the levels would feel. They would literally lose any significance and become just backdrops to the fights. That is why it was so essential to fill them with content and to encourage the player to explore them with the clear gameplay-wise benefit, or even better. A clear need. In Halo or COD there is no such need since these games are not about levels. 
They are about situations that the game puts you in. That is why the necessity in having to fill the levels with items disappears. In fact, it would be a burden and worse in the games overall if they had conventional health systems. Cause they actually have pacing. There is usually a moment of calm in which you just run through corridors and stuff, but then you are thrown into a room with tons of enemies and an entire orchestrated situation that is designed to be challenging. Imagine if you had to go through this situation with 10% of health left. The amount of pressure on you would be crippling, and the game would start to resemble something like Resident Evil 4, a game designed around tension and fear, whose genre is literally called survival horror. In a fun-loving action FPS, that design would be ridiculously out of place, and that is why, in order to prevent this problem, developers introduced regenerating health into their games. With lasting damage, every mistake you make becomes permanent. Each bit of damage will not disappear until you find a health kit. The definition of failure in this system is making too many mistakes over the course of the level. However, with the self-replenishing health system, failure comes from consecutive mistakes within a secluded situation. Every fight becomes isolated, since the player is renewed between encounters. However, with the conventional health system, he has to carry his mistakes from battle to battle. Thus, the fights become much more connected gameplay-wise, like a continuation of one another. So basically, game over with the self-regenerating health is the failure to properly handle a specific situation, but with lasting damage, it is the result of a prolonged poor play, or in other words, failure to properly handle the level as a whole. Not only that, the pacing of those modern games comes from their planned and controlled game design. Those games don't need to make the player slow down and collect items, because they already have cold moments built into them. Doom, however, has almost none of that. There are no carefully constructed situations or calculated pacing, instead it simply throws you into a meticulously constructed level and lets you progress through it on your own. There is no NPC to interact with, no vehicle driving segment, no stealth sections, no shooting gallery to spice things up, no moment in which you have to snipe someone from a distance. In Doom, all you do is run around a maze with enemies. This means that the pacing of this game is flat, so quite unlike games with excessive game design, those moments of running around and collecting items do have a place in Doom, a very special place. Consider this, if you kick ass and currently have 200% of both health and armor, you will feel on top of the world, right? Overpowered and safe. But answer me this. If you have only 10% left, will you feel in the same way? Of course not, you will feel tense, alerted and overwhelmed. This becomes the moments of high and low intensity which form the pacing of the game, and this pacing is the direct result of your actions. For example, there was a moment in Doom in which I had a lot of health and armor, so I got a bit careless and accidentally shot a rocket while the door was closing in front of me. This horrible mistake took almost all my health and, in addition to making me feel like an idiot, it forced me to become twice as focused to finish the fight and not die. Did you notice how my actions sort of form my own experience there, making a unique situation without any game design? That is why the implementation of conventional health system and item collecting is so valuable to Doom. It allows this game to have player-driven pacing. This sounds a bit far-fetched, George. Simply putting items in the game is not enough to create a player-driven pacing. I know, I was just getting to something a bit more tangible. The weapons. The arsenal of Doom is the bible of weapons and shooters. The melee weapons, the pistols, the shotguns, the automatic weapons, the rocket launchers, the exotic weapon and the final big gun. It might 
appear very stereotypical to a person familiar with the genre, but the thing to note is that this is the very game that defines this archetype. The weaponry of this game was so well balanced that it became the golden standard for at least 18 years. Even today we can still feel the influence of that original weapon lineup and, in fact, it makes me emotional even thinking about it. Shotgun is a weapon that has its own pacing, which forces you to dance to its rhythm. Each shot counts with this gun, which both punishes you for mistakes and rewards for successes. The chain gun, on the other hand, is a controllable weapon, in which individual shot doesn't mean anything. Basically, if you miss, it allows you to instantly fix your mistake. Since there is not as much punishment for missing as there was with the shotgun, it isn't as satisfying to hit the enemy with it. However, the feeling of freedom and flexibility that comes with the chain gun feels liberating in comparison to the restraints of the much more rewarding yet difficult to handle gun. Basically this is the main dichotomy of Doom. This juxtaposition of the two most commonly used weapons that are the exact opposites of each other, which is exactly why they complement one another so well. When you get tired with one weapon, you can switch to its very opposite, which feels refreshing in the contrast. And this ability to jump from mechanic to mechanic is exactly what keeps this gameplay diverse. This is one of the many reasons why Doom is superior to Wolfenstein 3D. In that game, each new weapon is objectively better than the previous one and considering that they all use the same type of ammunition, there is no reason to use anything but the most powerful gun you have, which forces you to play the game with one weapon the whole time and that becomes way too tedious, way too quickly. What is also a step forward from The Wolf 3D as enemies, and to be honest, there isn't that many enemy types in Doom. However, this game knows how to make a small rooster of enemies interesting. The fights are not so much about battling individual demons, but groups of demons. With one imp, his slow-moving projectiles are a mere nuisance. But when there are five or six imps all shooting fireballs, the process of dodging them becomes basically a matter of environmental orientation. The patterns that sporadically form from all those flying projectiles you have to avoid affect the directions you can go and the places in which you can stand. Or in other words, the layout of the battlefield becomes ever-changing and chaotic with you being forced to constantly reposition yourself. And not in this sterile, almost binary sense of the Grant's instant hit attacks that basically only care for whether you're strafing or not, but in a much more organic and fluent manner. You can see each of the fireballs, and dodging them becomes a matter of intuitive orientation and observation. This is what turns this gameplay from being purely about point and clicking on enemies into something more complex. Now you're forced to not just aim and shoot, but to move and adapt to the constantly changing layout with the failure being the unsuccessful understanding of the fireball's trajectory, speed and its correlation to the obstructions in the room. The simplicity of the game plays a major role in here. It becomes easier to be multitasking like that because the graphics are so straightforward and the aim is only horizontal, which is literally one dimension less complicated than the more advanced shooters. With such simplicity you can have fast-paced gameplay in which the point of fireballs is in how they realign the battlefield and force you to constantly move, which is exactly what pinkies are doing. They move directly towards you to inflict melee damage and considering how fast you can move, the only way they can achieve that is if you make a mistake. Essentially, Pinky on its own, or even a group of them, is not dangerous because of just how fast you are. But when you are trying to dodge fireballs that fly from all directions and have a Pinky that comes closer and closer, that is when they truly shine. They have noticeable amount of health and can obstruct both your and enemy's line of fire. And since they are always near you, or at least trying to be, this opens up possibilities for shielding against enemy fire, while at the same time making it more difficult for you to deal with more distant enemies. 
Furthermore, it bites, which means that you have to constantly move away from it and that can force you to run into a fireball. This adds another layer to maneuvering and dodging around the battlefield. While range demons are mostly staying in one place while shooting projectiles that force you to not cross their line of fire, pinkies are simply following you. To dodge fireballs, you can subtly move to left or right while remaining mostly stationary. Pinkies, however, force you to commit to the act of moving. You see how those two enemies play off of one another? This is exactly how each enemy was designed in this game, so that it could team up with any other demon. Think of enemy types as building blocks, out of which the game creates various patterns to throw at you. And these patterns are diverse. It can make you fight a group of grunts and imps surrounding a caca demon. It can make you fight floating skulls while dealing with barons, the list goes on and on. And because each enemy is so specific in his role, even fluctuations in numbers can make up for an entirely different encounter. If there is a group of imps and grunts, whether there are more grunts or imps determines the way the fight plays out. This is how the game maintains variety and prevents itself from becoming overly repetitive. You know each enemy individually, so when the game throws a pattern of those familiar enemy types at you, you sort of figure out how to deal with this pattern based on your familiarity with those basic enemy types. What it all means is that when you enter a room filled with enemies, you immediately know what to do and how to win, without even thinking about it. Yet the battle that ensues still manages to be engaging. Okay, wait a second. You know what, Seal? I think I should switch to Ultra Violence difficulty. I know I'll probably regret that, but I just wanna give it a go. Sure, go for it. It's your show after all. Hey, this looks weirdly familiar. I, I remember this grunt being up there and... Wait! Does this mean that my uncle, when he gave me my first game to play, set it up to the highest difficulty? Wow. This is probably the most uninteresting and irrelevant bit of information I ever heard you say on this entire show. By now I've reached the final episode and at this point the level design of Doom went from good to ingenious. These levels weren't made by Romero though, they were designed by the man that replaced Tom Hall, Sandy Peterson. While Romero was focused on designing levels that would feel deliberate and involving, basically trying to make each level a coherent experience, Sandy was designing with broad strokes. His levels are bolder, bigger in scope and borderline experimental. He made some of the most ambitious choices in his levels, in fact, going as far as to create the very first ever rocket jump. And not on accident like he did in Quake, but deliberate. At this point you've probably noticed how I keep mentioning that Doom is repetitive and there is no beating around the bush now, it is extremely repetitive. Doom rarely introduces anything new, it relies on the established mechanics with just enough variety to prevent the player's boredom. Compare that to Half-Life, in which the game doesn't so much rely on patterns of enemies as on their individual design. The game is structured around introducing a new enemy type that plays unlike any other, making you fight this type of enemy for some time and then throwing a new enemy with new mechanic and forgetting about the previous one. Doom, in comparison, is stale and in addition to making you fight same enemies over and over again, the enemies themselves don't differ that fundamentally when you think about it. There are no hunters, elites, flood and the monumental difference between how you fight these enemies. In fact, it all sounds extremely similar to Wolfenstein 3D. In it, we too run around killing the same enemies with the same guns while collecting the same items. Yet there is something that elevates Doom above its predecessor. 
Let's look at enemies for instance. In both Doom and Wolfenstein there is a very limited array of enemies, but in Doom each enemy type is distinct. Instead of making you use one weapon the whole time, Doom inclines you to use different guns. Furthermore, in Wolf 3D there is only one parameter to worry about, while in Doom you not only have armor added to the mix, but can increase your stats to 200% of the norm. And lastly, even though the environments all look similarly, each level has a unique identity. I feel like you can look at all this rationally and say that Doom is basically Wolfenstein 3D, just with more content. And yes! It is. But don't you see how this added content changes everything? Now this Wolfenstein formula gets infused with a little dose of variety in all of its aspects and that variety is exactly what manages to prevent this repetitive gameplay from becoming boring. There is spacing now, different mechanics, variable fight scenarios and you can actually tell one level from another. It's still no Half-Life, you know? Yes, exactly. So let me ask you this one million dollar question. Why is it still playable then? I mean people still play this game and find it fun. Even after the genre has evolved so much. Now we actually have games that are so variable and consistently diverse that the repetitive doom should be rendered unplayable. But it is not only still popular, there is an actual demand for this type of gameplay. There are games like Serious Sam, Painkiller and even the new Doom, all of which were successful mind you, in which the developers try to go back and recapture this old style. This raises the question, why? I actually have a theory concerning this and Seal, I want you to listen to it and just keep me in check alright? Just in case my theory will be too far out there. Oh sure, I'm actually curious as to what sort of thing your biased mind could have conjured up to defend its nostalgic bias. Oh come on! I believe that the reason why Doom stands the test of time is exactly because of all the things that the genre deemed outdated. The strength of Doom is its repetitiveness, its primitive graphics, its inability to look up or down, its lack of any coherent game design, those are all canonically considered to be flaws, which is why developers gradually remove them from their games. Yet in spite of what logic says, Doom is not inferior, but simply different. It is a game that tries to get as close as possible to being boring, yet have just enough variety to remain engaging. And in doing so, it creates a repetitive gameplay that manages to be interesting without becoming overly involving, or in other words, mindless. And that mindless state opens up new possibilities. It allows Doom to create a game of pure gameplay, which feels more visceral and dynamic than almost any sin game in industry ever produced. Did you notice how liberating it feels to play a game like Doom today? There are no rules aside from the self-explanatory ones, no objectives you need to keep in mind, no targets you need to avoid shooting at, no items you don't have to pick up, the game never introduces an enemy that you have to run away from or fight in a cryptic fashion, there are no puzzles or situations with cryptic solutions, you just run where you feel like, shoot everyone you encounter, pick up everything you want until eventually you find an exit. It's a mindless, unrestrained gameplay that lets you simply play. This repetitiveness of gameplay adds a special quality to it, addictiveness. You become hooked on the system of Doom, the satisfaction of its basic mechanics as well as the little bit of variety that prevents the game from becoming boring draws you in and simply doesn't let you out. Mindless gameplay without any significant variety is impulsive and Doom embraces that. Its maze-like level design with the sole goal of finding an exit makes you act like a rat in a maze. And since the levels are abstract, there are no indications of where to go, nor any sort of understandable layouts that would make mazes feel even remotely comprehensible, there is nothing but your empiric, impulsive running. There are no distractions or story or any other reason to actually turn your brain on, so you see, 
Everything in this game is designed to incline the player to play mindlessly. Do not think of anything, but simply act. And the result is this. A game that is thoughtless, fast, fun and addictive. A game that basically asks you to turn your brain off and become an animal for a while. An animal that operates on nothing but pure impulse. An animal that mindlessly runs toward his goal while killing everyone in his path and taking everything that he wants. And doing that with immense efficiency and speed. This is primal and primitive gameplay that manages through an impeccable combination of elements to become satisfying on the most carnal and basic level. And that is something that no Half-Life, Call of Duty or Halo could ever do, since they treat you like a thinking human being. But Doom treats you like nothing more than a rat in a maze. So, what do you think, Seal? Well, I'm not so sure about this whole animal business, but I agree about Doom being a mindless, fast-paced game with an addictive quality to it. If it wasn't for all this metaphorical fluff, I would say you weren't that far off. Well, I'm just glad that you think that I wasn't just completely wrong there. I mean, seriously, Doom is such a special game for me. And not just because it was one of the very first games that I've ever played, you see. Doom was the very game that got me into old games. So back in the late 2000s I was only playing modern games and even though I would often get interested in hearing about old titles, I would never try them out for some reason. That was until eventually I got an inclination to revisit one of the oldest games that I remember, Doom. I was blown away. After playing modern shooters, to see something so raw and visceral like Doom was refreshing. But it wasn't just that, I was also shocked at how well designed it was. Like it was a genuinely good game, even in comparison to what I was playing at the time. It was, as they say, a game that holds up after the years. After finishing Doom, I immediately decided to try out some other games that I loved as a kid and, to my surprise, quite a number of them were still fun to play. Once I ran out of the limited amount of my childhood games, I've decided to give games I had no nostalgic connection to a go. Games that I considered to be classics. So I've played games. Games like Grim Fandango and Chrono Trigger. Super Metroid and Siberia, Star Control 2 and The Last Express, Super Mario World and Fantasy Star 4, Half-Life and Silent Hill 2, Beyond Good and Evil and Planescape Torment, Deus Ex and The Longest Journey, Shadow of the Colossus and The Legend of Zelda, Majora's Mask. There are many, many more games, each individual one of which is a brilliant radiant star of a man's power, and remember, I've never played any of them as a kid. But the truth is, they didn't require me to be wearing nostalgic glasses in order to appreciate them. In fact, being nostalgic towards them would probably blind me to their true nature, for I would not be able to distinguish the actual game from the memories I associate to it. It's like as if those metaphorical nostalgic sunglasses were dimming the light of the star making it easier for me to see it, but presenting only a fraction of its true potential. So when I looked at the star without any protection, without any cynicism or nostalgia clouding my mind, I was overwhelmed. I have lived in worlds that were so immersive, I would forget about the real one. I have experienced gameplays that were so engaging, I would not be able to keep the track of time. I've listened to stories that were not just emotional, deep or interesting, they were more than that, they were truthful. But most of all, I've played games that didn't just entertain me, but changed me, enriched my life in more ways than I could ever imagine, games that basically made me into who I am today. Before all this, I was often saying stuff like... <clears throat> I'm still waiting for this definitive gaming masterpiece to come out, which would truly once and for all prove that games 
are an art form. Well, now I know at least 30 games that I can confidently consider great works of art, on par with the greatest works of cinema and literature. And it wasn't because I've waited long enough to see a new game worthy of being called a great work of art come out, but because I've looked back and saw every time it already happened. There is so much beauty in the world of games, so many titles that can make you feel emotions that you might never even believe games are capable of conveying that tell stories that you might only expect from a masterful piece of literature, that create worlds so atmospheric there is literally nothing to even compare it to. And all of it would be lost to me if I were to keep thinking of those games as outdated or not as legit as modern games. But you see, true works of art do not age, they are timeless. Doom showed me what games are truly capable of and for that I can never thank it enough. So you know, I've played Doom in the 90s and I thought it was great when I didn't know any better. I've played it in 2000s and I was shocked at how different it was to modern games. And even now, after I've played dozens upon dozens of shooters, both old and new, I still think the Doom is a great game. Right? Yeah, definitely. I don't think anyone would argue with that. Ah, uh, okay. I was worried there for a second. You are still a biased prick, though. <laughs>